Okay, hey there, folks. Since book tour and conventions are still on hold for a while longer, I figured I'd bring book tour to you. So welcome to Russ's Rock and Roller Coaster Season 4, Intriguing Interviews with Creative Minds. Uh, tonight, please welcome Mike Johnson, the New York Times bestselling writer of comics, games, and animation. He has written extensively for the Star Trek and Blade Runner franchises, as well as for Batman, Superman, Supergirl, Fringe, Warehouse 13, and for the Emmy-winning animated show Transformers Prime. Prior to working, working uh, writing full-time, Mike worked in film and TV development for writer-producers Alex Kurtzman and Roberto Orsi. All right, welcome, Mike. Thank you. Thank you for having me. All right. Thank you for uh, thank you for hosting um, this virtual uh, panel in a world without. All right. Without happy it. to do it. No, no. As a heads up to the folks at home, feel free to send me notes or questions you have for me or Mike in the chat box during the show, and we'll get to a few at the end. All right. So let's start at the beginning, as we always do. Uh, so where were you born and where'd you grow up? I was born in Seattle, Washington. Uh, lived there till I was about eight years old. So go Seahawks. And then my sports allegiances start to get fractured. We moved to Memphis, Tennessee hmm. when I was eight. Uh, my dad was working at St. Jude's Hospital there. Is he a doctor? And, uh, yep. And uh, uh, what's he, his specialty? Uh, his specialty was uh, pediatric oncology. Oh, wow. That's so, right. Yeah. But St. Jude's great place for, for, for that. And he pioneered the bone marrow transplantation unit there. Um, and Memphis was great. We lived there for four years and it was kind of like all American Spielberg boyhood. This was the early first half of the 1980s. Right. And, uh, that's where I got, that's where I started getting into comics was, uh, was in Memphis. We, I had a, my fourth grade teacher had a stack of comics that her husband had given her like, hey, let the kids read these. And she put them in the back of the classroom. When you were done with your classwork, you could go back and get a comic. And that's where I started finding like classic Marvel, uh, late 70s, early 80s Marvel, and just got hooked. And then when, uh, when I was 12, we moved to Chicago. And that's where I spent the rest of my formative years. So go oh. Cubs. Well, okay. Um, okay. So hold on. There's, 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 there's a lot there I want to get into. Yeah. Hold on a second. So, all right. So you, you were a little kid in Seattle, mm -hmm. which definitely has, I've been, I mean, I've spent some time out there. It has a very distinct vibe out there, Pacific yeah. Northwest. You go to Memphis, which is a complete, I mean, I've never been, but from what I know it's about culture it, shock. Right. Right. A totally different kind of, you know, away from all that green and gray and mist and out to like the heat. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when you started re reading Marvel, what were you reading specifically? Like, what was your journey? I remember the first issue, the, the one I remember really clearly was Uncanny X-Men number 140, which is the cover with Wendigo on the cover. And uh, John Byrne, Claremont Byrne. Um, and uh, that one just hooked me. And then I started going, there was a, well, actually, I, I couldn't really go to the comic shop very often. We didn't live... Uh, near a comic shop, but there was one store called Memphis Comics and Records, which was like the, the the holy temple of comics. If you lived in Memphis at that time, like I, but I could only get convinced my mom to drive me there like once every six months or something. Like it was a special deal. Mm -hmm. So otherwise, I would get them at um, Rexall Drugstore, right, the old spinner rack, right. um, and then uh, eventually I subscribed. And I subscribed to Uncanny, New Mutants, and Alpha Flight through Marvel. They had a deal where you could get 16 issues for the price of 12. Right. So, uh, and they used to come in these like just boring brown paper wrappers. Nope. Not, not, not a wrapper, it was like a sleeve. So the comic could like fall out in the mail. But um, so that was a big deal. So I, I really got read comics steadily through the mail like it was like hey there's a new issue here and it was like a big event and i would savor it and i would like you know go to my room and like okay now we're gonna read this month's issue you know where you know cut to 20 years later people go to the comic store and buy like 30 comics and you got a big stack and kind of blow through them yep. you know, when i was a kid it was like and i didn't have any money either so oh, you know that, that right. was a, might have been a birthday present those subscriptions so it was like a big deal like to get the monthly issue and I had the three different comics. So, um, and it was a great time to be um, 
reading those particular comics, it was obviously, you know, Byrne was, was launching Alpha Flight. Paul Smith was doing X-Men and then John Romita Jr. Um, and then Bill Sienkiewicz came on New Mutants. And that, so that was just a really cool time to be reading those few books. And then I, you know, I'd pick up other, other, uh, it's so funny now that Avengers is such a big deal, but back then Avengers was like, oh yeah, the team book with Captain America and Thor and Hulk, but X-Men was really where it's at. Right. Yeah. yeah. So were you strictly a Marvel guy? Did you come? Um, I was here? mostly, yeah, I was mostly a Marvel guy. Um, I got really into crisis on infinite earths, I think, because it had, it sort of told a story encompassing the whole history of the DC universe, stuff that I didn't really know about. Um, you know, I had a bunch of Superman and Batman comics. You could get at the drugstore, they packaged them in, in like plastic, you get like three issues of something. So you get like a random world's finest and a random flash and, and something like that. But um, yeah, I was pretty much a, a Marvel boy. I started to get really into DC with um, Justice League uh, International, you know, the the um, when it took more of a comedic bend. I was big on that and uh, started reading more and more DC. So when you were a kid, was it just you? Do you have brothers, sisters? I had two brothers, one older, one younger, um, close close in age, but they were not really into comics. They were, you know, mm. kids all have their own kind of thing and. Um, we did, you know, since this was the early 80s, we were all into G.I. Joe and Transformers. So that was a big deal. And when you've got siblings, it's like, well, how come he got that figure or that vehicle? Oh, and yes. I didn't. And I got this one. <laughs> no, and even though this one is the one I wanted, I really want his because he has it and I don't, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but it was a great time. And that was mostly in Memphis when, when we were, you know, I was 8 to 12, which is kind of the sweet spot for all yeah. that stuff. So and, we know, uh, so those are like, so that was what, around 1980, early 80s? Yeah, I was born in 73, so right. uh, 81 to 85. Okay, yeah, so we're, we're about the same, we're about the same age. So you, also, yeah. you, you were a Spielberg kid, I'm assuming? Uh, very much so. I mean, I was, I, I was talking about this the other day with, with my family, like, I felt like I was Elliot in E.T. Like that was like, and that kind of suburban life that they lived in, it was like, yeah absolutely sweet spot and uh to the point where when i saw last crusade i was like a jaded 16 year old like <laughs> analyzing it from a film perspective and how it was like you know oh they just copied raiders and all this stuff so it's just funny looking back but when you're a kid um you know i remember going to see Temple of Doom, and it was like, oh my god! I was, I know, as a kid, it was, that was, that was, great. It was great. Eating brains, I know, <laughs> tearing hearts out. It was, no, it was incredible. Oh, yeah, the, the old Kali Ma, Kali Ma, Kali Ma. So look, so so you were, so you were, in, so you had a little bit of a, you were into sports a little bit, right? You said you, were mm -hmm. yeah, right. yeah. So I was, um, you were a football guy, baseball, football. Like my parents, my parents are from Australia, um, and really. So they were kind of new to the U.S., um, you know, in the '70s, and 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 my and they they both you know were liked sports, and and they would let us watch Monday Night Football, cool. and I, so one of my earliest memories is like lying on the floor drawing the different helmet logos for the for the NFL. So was that so, something that was that where it started with you with with the, with the artistry? Yeah, probably. I mean, I've always it's funny. I've always been kind of weirdly interested in like logos and um, design that way. I mean, I definitely got into the storytelling with, with comics, but um, I really loved, um, I just paid attention, even in the comics, like the logo design, the lettering and all of that. So, um, and then for the NFL, I just loved, there was essentially cartoons, right? Every, every helmet decal is like its own sort of story about the team or the, um, the city that it's in. And we had the Seahawks, which had this um, Native American uh, design inspired by totem poles for the bird. Um, yeah, so I just remember we getting into the end of Monday Night Football was a big deal because we got to stay up a little later. Are you now torn between the Seahawks and the Bears? No, I'm actually pretty hardcore Seahawks because actually my dad 
did some charity work with the Seahawks All right. when I was a kid. So we got to go to the Seahawks Christmas party one year. I remember meeting Jim Zorn and Steve Largent. So it was like, oh, nice. Um, Seahawks for life. And we actually moved to Chicago in 85, right before the Bears won the Super Bowl. Right. The fridge. And in my music class in I guess, seventh grade, um, we had to sing the Super Bowl Shuffle like, as a joke because the Super Bowl Shuffle had just <laughs> come out. About that. And we all had to like learn the words. So I, you know, my name is Sweetness. And I like to dance. You know, it's still in my brain. But I felt, I felt, I was 12 years old and I felt like I was betraying the Seahawks. Yeah. Because right. I was singing the Super Bowl Shuffle. For the Bears. The Bears. So I have, a, I have a big soft spot for the Bears. If, if the Seahawks aren't playing, I'll root for the Bears. All right. And, fair enough. All right. Yeah. So, so, so Star Trek was obviously a big influence on you. Yeah. Did you start watching it as a kid? Like, how, how, did, mm-hmm. how did you kind of get into Star Trek? Yeah. I, um, I mean, I first saw I probably, like, even before I can remember watching um, the reruns on, the, uh, on TV in the late 70s. But um, what I really remember is I had the um, the Mego action figures that had like the cloth uniforms. Yo, oh, I had them. I probably knew who Spock might be the earliest um, pop culture character I remember. Yeah, just as a little kid, like he's got pointy ears. It's very you know accessible to kids. Like that's that's interesting. Um, so I remember I had my had my Spock figure. Um, and then again, in the sweet spot for the movies coming out, although I was a little young for the motion picture yep. and we all love Star Wars, obviously. And, and uh, me and my brothers, my dad took us to see the motion picture and the motion picture is pretty heady sci-fi, yep. you know, and we were like, where are the Wookiees? Where right. are the spaceships going really fast? You know, cause they have that iconic slow introduction of the enterprise. And I can't remember. Movie. It was what about 70. Nine, nine, right, right. So yeah, so yeah. You, and you then uh, what six? That's I was that's, six. That's, yeah. that's a little. That's a little. That's a little. Uh, you know, um, intellectual for a six year old. Yeah, it's a little heavy for uh, yeah. for um, and then but then Wrath of Khan came out. Oh, and I was like nine. Really cool. It was like the greatest movie ever made. Yeah. And then I, you know, I love that they kind of introduced serial storytelling in movies. They were almost doing the Marvel thing back then when you had Search for Spock and Voyage Home. Those three movies are really like a, a trilogy that is seamlessly yep. telling one story. Yep. Um, so yeah, that was it. It was, and then and then I mean the biggest thing is that I was fourteen when the next generation hit. Yeah. And I remember I was so excited for that show coming. I remember getting the TV. Yeah. Couldn't watch it on the big family TV because nobody else wanted to watch it, so I had to go up and watch it on the the little. Uh, yeah office tv and it was just the greatest so i was i was locked in for tng and then uh throughout my life after that yes yeah, funny. i remember when um when it got announced that next generation was coming i mean i was so excited i couldn't i couldn't wait because i was you know i love i loved the you know kirk and spock and bones i love i loved it all i was a huge trekking as a kid and it came out and i remember so tng was what about 80 87 so i was what 16 Mm-hmm. came out and i went ow <laughs> it didn't work exactly and i couldn't mm-hmm. right right then and there. really wow but, but here's what happened though so it went on for full seven years it went on years later i was i did a study abroad for college in england in 94 and a buddy of mine in the dorms was watching it he was like i'm like what do you watch he's like next generation i'm like ugh but I'm like, all right, I'll watch. And he watches one. And I'm like, oh, this is stupid. For whatever reason, I was complaining about it. But every day I would come back and I would like hate it a little bit less. And by like the eighth episode, I'm like, oh my God, this is the greatest show ever. I can't believe it took me 20 years to watch it. What was my problem? <laughs> so Yeah, well, that's right. That's like the the most zealous, nothing like the zealots, uh, yeah. zealotry of a convert, right? Well, like, yeah, well, you know what it was? Because you know, those first two seasons fans. You know, were awkward because they still kind of had like the, 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 the cheesy dunk, dunk, dun from the original show, but it was trying to be its own thing. Yeah. Sort of like the original and it didn't have its voice really. Once yeah. it kind of became its own show, it really kind of got great. So, yeah. so you are you now um, 
do you consider yourself, you're just a Trekkie, you don't care, or are you like a diehard, you're a next gen guy and you're an original series guy? Did you go on and watch the other series beyond that? Or I did. Um, I really am like a, a, a TOS and TNG. We, we just speak in acronyms basically yep. uh, on the franchise. We're just, yeah, it's all ENT and VO, Y. Um, yeah, I watched the others. Um, I didn't watch as many episodes. Uh, like I watched every TNG. I watched, um, a pro- when I, I'm talking about first airing, I probably watched about half of TS9 and getting caught up later. Same with Voyager. And then I actually went back and rewatched Enterprise last year and it was really good. I really liked the, the take that they had mm-hmm. on, um, on the franchise and the evolution of it. So, um, but yeah, I'm a T actually I'll, I'll, I'll show you my, here's a little behind the scenes. So I've got a Blade Runner. Yes. I see in I love background. It. Love it. But my daily, um, the zoom I use for all of my work meetings is actually this one right here. Oh, uh-huh, nice. That's my office basically. Nice. Love um, it. It's quiet. There's nobody there. There you go. Uh-huh. Night shift. And then if I'm being obnoxious, I'll put that up. <laughs> I love it. Absolutely. Love uh, it. This is a quick tour through my zoom backgrounds. And then this movie actually was a big black uh, hole deal for me when i was a kid black hole i saw that i saw that in the theater yeah awesome movie i love that movie i gotta see it again i mean i I, i'm sure it's probably ridiculous but who cares it's utterly ridiculous but the effects were done by ilm guys right and it's got a john barry score which is incredible this is actually a really cool scene i gotta see that i mean i i i remember that i remember where i was i was in my basement watching the incredible hulk on tv oh yeah and my dad comes down and he says listen you want to go to the movies and see the black hole i'm like let's go wow (laughs) so i went from from the hulk to the black hole in the space of an hour that's that's just good pop culture there you go maximilian with the yes well with the the spinning blade right all right so look so obviously you know so star trek was a big influence and you wound up doing a lot of Blade Runner, which we'll get into later. So Blade Runner is a very different kind of sci-fi and especially at the time, you know, we, mm-hmm. you know, Star Wars kind of changed, was a game changer for all of us. Um, it made it, you know, it was a, basically, a, you know, a Western in space, you know, it was just a big action adventure and Star Trek both, um, you know, were to different degrees, mixes of, you know, space opera and themes and you know all sorts of fun and then here comes blade runner which is a this dark rainy noirish tale and there's really kind of not a lot to the plot quite honestly mm-hmm. it was pretty, very pretty moody yeah. and atmospheric um but you were probably i mean i was only about nine or ten when it came out so you're probably just a little bit younger was it just were you just a little too young did you come to it later yeah i uh i didn't see it in the theater yeah i think think my folks probably thought it was a little old skewing Uh, i like to joke they they took us to raiders with harrison ford which had people's faces melting off yeah right blade runner Um, (laughs) yeah so i i think i first saw blade runner on vhs um and then just watched it over and over and then in chicago they would occasionally put you know retro movies on the big screen yeah so it's, i first saw it in the on the big screen in chicago oh nice and um and then when i moved to la you know one of the best things about la is they regularly put um classic movies on the big screen oh that's great so i, I saw it a couple times in la on the big screen um well they had the release they had the re-release of the of the director's cut so that was that was kind of brought it back in a big way all right um, so that's actually a yeah. good transition so so you when did you move to la I moved to LA in 1998. And was that 25 to go? Or because this is when you, so when that you, was, tell me how you got really serious about writing. Talk to me about that. Yeah. I mean, um, I really wanted to, to draw first. And I think like a lot of comics writers are failed comics artists, but I wanted to do like the other big comics influence, huge was like Asterix and Tintin books. So those like complete stories in a graphic album, those I really loved. And I thought, you know, I'd like to do that one day. 
write and draw my own. And then after college, I really worked hard at the art and was sending submissions off to editors and getting feedback, but I was never getting fast enough or yeah. like I could, I could, I could draw decently, but it would take me a week. Did you go to school? Hey. Did you go to school for graphic design? No, I went to college and majored in English. Okay. So I did a lot of writing there and, and, um, but I didn't, uh, I, so I came at writing through the art actually. I didn't really come at it from a pure writing background. Um, and then I, so I got to the point where I realized I, it was like a baseball player. He's like, I'm probably not going to make it to the majors. Right. Um, so I thought, you know, I was loved movies. I'm going to go work. I'm going to go see if I can go work in movies. And I didn't, I wasn't, I, I didn't have a firm idea. I was kind of dumb. I didn't have a firm idea of what I wanted to do in movies. So I just thought I'll get a job in the movie industry. I had a vague idea about writing, but I wasn't like churning out screenplays or anything. Um, so I moved to LA and got a, a internship. And, and once you're in the system, you start meeting people and other opportunities come up and, and, um, you know, that's why I tell people who are interested. It's like, just get, get whatever job you can. If it's on set, if it's in development, you know, you could be in casting or anything. You just get in there so you can start meeting people and opportunities will come your way. Um, and then I started to get serious about writing. So I was working in film development and Where? Um, so I started my internship, my first assistantship was with Sean Connery's production company, a company called Fountain Bridge Films. And this was in 98, 99. Uh, he had just come off um, Entrapment uh, and uh, he was making, um, they're about to make Finding Forrester. And then from there, I moved to a production company at Columbia Pictures called Out of the Blue, which did was- you get did, you, did you meet Sean Connery? Yeah, yeah, I was his like, do errands for him and stuff. Really? Yeah. What was, what was, was he great. like? What was Fantastic. He, like? he was great. He was, he was funny. And, you know, the thing about him was he was nice to the people uh, behind the scenes. Like in Hollywood, a lot of people can be nice in front of the camera and not so nice behind when the cameras are off and not so nice to people who are lower in the trenches. He was, ni he was nice to everybody. And it didn't matter if you were an intern or the delivery guy or whatever. Um, he was, he was just a kind person and, um, yeah, it was really fun. It was really surreal. I mean, I'd been living in Portland working at a bookstore and then three months later, I'm like hanging out with James Bond, hanging out with <laughs> James Bond. It was really weird. <laughs> really weird. It's great though. It seems surreal now, but, um, were you, it was great. Were you, were you tempted to like, just like dork out and want to ask him every James Bond question there was? Yeah. I mean, um, yeah, we didn't really talk about it. We oh, I'm sure you didn't. But yeah, did you, yeah, we did just talked about it. Did you? Oh, want yeah. To? Oh, absolutely. I wanted to. Hundred mm -hmm. percent. Yeah. No, I wanted to be like. Um, uh, did you? Yeah, well, did the you Untouchables really? was one of my favorite movies. Oh, we, great. Like, living in Chicago and the Untouchables. What are you prepared like, to do? Yeah. Yeah. What are you prepared to do? Did you wait? Did you just want to Back. say it to him once? Just say, come on, just say it. Just give me the line. Yeah. Bond Back to Chicago. Way. Yeah. Oh, John. Yeah. Just, Bond, just, Bond. just, just say it. Come on. Just one time. Just do uh, it. <laughs> yeah. The temptation was there. And he probably would have laughed about it. He yeah. was, uh, he, he had a great sense of humor and was yeah. just, uh, I was fond of, of him and, you know, sorry to hear him of his passing. But yeah. Yeah. He, 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 was, he was, he was great, 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 great bond. Great. He was great, great in the you untouchables. Know, You're right. And actually you mentioned finding Forrester, which I actually saw in the theater. And my recollection is that it was pretty good actually. Yeah. It's a good movie. Yeah. All right. So look. So you went. So you were, you were you were with Sean Connery for a while. Then where'd you go? I went to a company called Out of the Blue to work for a producer named Sid Gannis. Um, and Sid had actually worked for Lucasfilm back in the day in marketing um, on Star Wars and Indiana Jones. Sid had his own production deal, and he, it was sort of a, another culture shock because I went from Sean Connery and it, Out of the Blue. We were developing, producing Adam Sandler vehicles. Huh. So. I ended, I, I, I ended up working in that uh, world for a while, mm. um, which was really fun. I worked on a movie called The Master of Disguise with Dana Carvey, <laughs> yeah. and uh, just hanging out with Carvey, who was another great, I've been pretty lucky in, in the, the, the famous people I met, the, the big actors and things. Yeah. Um, most of them have been really great. Like Sandler's awesome. 
and McCarthy was just hilarious and great. And uh, oh, that's cool. That's cool. so that was fun. And then um, after that, I, I ended up working at Alex Kurtzman and Bob Corsi's company. So talk, talk to me, talk to me about that a little bit. Yeah. So I had, uh, I was working for an, I was working as a creative executive at, at Sid Gannis's company. And then um, the company was changing and I had the opportunity to either go into physical production, which is like the hardcore you're on sets every day. Um, what they call line producing. Yep. Um, or I could, one of the upper executives at out of the blue was going to Kurtzman and Orsi's company. And she said, do you want to come with me as an assistant? And that was, that was a step down in the ladder, but it was such an exciting opportunity because I knew the kind of movies they were making were the movies that I, I loved, those kind of big right. sci-fi movies. Right. They'd just come off Mission Impossible 3. Um, I think they'd signed to do Star Trek and they'd also worked on Alias, which was a show I loved. Right. So it was like, do you want to go work for those guys? Do you want to work in physical oh, production? Hell yeah. Yeah, yeah and I, <laughs> I went and worked, I went to be an assistant first and later a creative executive for Alex and Bob. Wow. which was the best decision I ever made. And that was when that was, that was how I got into Star Trek because they were. So talk, right. talk to me about that. So what, what were you doing with those guys? Yeah. So, um, you know, I was doing kind of the lower level production company work. You read incoming scripts that come in, you write what's called coverage, which is basically a synopsis of the scripts. Um, you help out in sort of brainstorming sessions about upcoming shows. I remember fringe was starting to happen at that point. Wow. Um, and th those guys were just so great. I mean, they are so great. They, they, they were so great about making everybody feel included. Like we were a team. We, our office was in a bungalow on the universal lot just outside the Amblin compound. So we would go and get lunch at the Amblin Adobe office every day. Um, it was great. Um, and, and it was just fun. This was like, oh, six to 2010 and it was just a, a so really what were you moment. so what shows or movies did you have any kind of hand did you have touches on um so star trek i was always there the two star trek movies they did is like a sounding board and like read this what do you think and then the big thing was they said hey will you write the prequel comic um wait so hang on before you get it just before you get into yeah, that, yeah. you're talking about the first reboot movie with um the, the most recent cast that's right 2009 yeah so what was the so at that time you know there had been a gap between star trek movies right since we had last seen a star trek movie and there was a lot of anticipation what was the at that time so you were literally you were you were in the rooms right mm -hmm. what was the sense of what was the buzz going on at then because at that moment because it was sort of you know, hey, we're, come, we're we're bringing it back. Was there a sense in the room that you know what we we're, we think we're really onto something, or was it like you know what we're just going to try it and hope for the best? Or like, what was the vibe yeah. at that time? The vibe I remember was that this is a great opportunity. That the franchise was at a bit of a lull at that point, yep. And that this was an opportunity to inject some real life into it on the on a, on, on a movie scale. Um, as opposed to a television scale. So they were they were aiming big. Um, I think certainly there was trepidation about like, is this gonna work? I think two things mattered. One was that everybody there was coming at it from a position of love, even people that weren't um, avowed Star Trek fans like JJ. But then we had Bob Orsi who was as big a Trek fan and as knowledgeable as you could have who was making sure everything felt appropriately Trek. The other huge thing that happened was that they got Leonard Nimoy involved and they, they went right. to Leonard yeah. Nimoy and said, here's what we're thinking. Are you in? And he blessed his, his agree, agreeing to do the movie was like blessing it as a Star Trek project. Right. So that was a huge deal. And I think right. it allayed a lot of the fears that fans might've had that it wasn't just these people coming in out of nowhere to mess up their franchise. Yeah, so it like, had well, a blessing. Well, yeah, one of the godfathers of Star Trek says, okay, you know, you're exactly you're right. And then I think the other, the other, I like, I like to think that JJ, JJ's superpower is actually casting. Mm -hmm. When you look at all the shows and the movies he's done, what a fun um, that cast was that spot cast is, on. Yeah, it's incredible. It's incredible. And I it's think, perfect. I think it's perfect. 
Yeah, and once people saw them in the roles and saw the movie, I think they fell in love with them. And I think they were written. I, I, I encourage fans if they can get their hands on the um, script for the 2009 movie. Um, you can see that the characters are really there and the words as well. You combine that with the right actors and you get a great movie. Yeah. So. All right, so, so the movie explodes. Big hit, yeah. big hit. Everyone's excited. And then they say to you, uh, so that they actually, before the movie came out, they knew they wanted to do a comic book prequel. Okay. And, uh, they knew that I was a comic book nerd. Right. They knew my backstory that I wanted to do comics and it's like failed comic book artist and, uh, started and the, the prequel comic called countdown got a great, got a great response. Um, and then, um, a couple of years later, after I think around maybe it was after Into Darkness came out, we launched an ongoing um, Star Trek comic book, um, which was which went for sixty issues, and that that was kind of filling in between movies because we didn't have any TV shows at that point. Right. It was really the movies that were carrying Star Trek. So um, when you were when you were writing the. You know, I mean, I because I know a lot of Star Trek writers, I hear a lot of this about about this a lot. But were you given lots of restrictions and rules about what you could and couldn't do? Actually, I was free from that because we were in in the movie universe timeline. So what would they call right. the Kelvin timeline? Right. So we had some freedom, and and Bob was the creative overseer of the comics. So, you know, we would just talk about you know, hey, let's take this episode and see it through the prism of the new characters, and we would always be respectful to the original source material, but we wanted to take advantage of the fact that we could tell Kirk and Spock adventures um, without having to be restrained by everything that had come before. I think the special magic trick of that movie was they didn't relaunch everything and say everything that came before didn't matter. Right. By having Nimoy and the time travel, right. they kept it actually within the canon of, of the, and it's a very Star Trek thing to do, right? Like yep. switch to another timeline and show what happens so we had a lot of freedom in the comics which was great and i loved just like writing in the voices of the um of those actors and the, and the, i don't know how many times oh, it was so seen. so what was that like so you're sitting there right you're a lifelong trekkie mm -hmm. you, know, you grew up on you grew up on kirk and spock and mccoy yeah. and the, you know that five-year mission and then you're in the room they're making that they're about to make this movie and they say all right you know what fill in some blanks for us run wild with it how was it to sit there and be like whoa i get to i get to yeah. tell kirk what to say yeah that was <laughs> wild it was it was fantastic i think i had it easier because i was i was doing pine kirk instead of shatner kirk so maybe right. i wasn't i didn't feel the pressure of yeah yeah decades of fandom <laughs> um like yeah. people that just knee jerk didn't like the kelvin universe weren't gonna like weren't going to read the comics right so uh i want to, i just want to make sure i captured the spirit of the um nice. cool spirit of the new movies and but also the spirit of track in general so it was it was great all right so good so before we move on to the next piece of it so you've written a lot, many comic books over the years i'm a huge comic book fan i mean you can't i mean yeah, you, I can you tell. Come from back there yeah. right, right behind me there's just wall there's a wall and wall of comics i'm mean, including nice. including some of yours um thank you I, I dabbled in comics writing once upon a time myself. I happen to love the medium um, as a reader and as a creator. What what do you like? What is it about the comic book medium that you are drawn to? Oh, wow. That's a great question. Um, that's kind of the ultimate question. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the simple answer, it might sound a little trite, is the combination of words and images. Mm -hmm. And... Um, reading comics is its own mental exercise. Yeah. You're not simply sitting back and watching something play out. There's an interactivity um, with it where um, in, a, in a sense you have control over how you read it. Like, are you taking the image first when you turn the page? Are you reading, are you, are you just starting with the word balloons? Are you like the world, there's an interactivity to it that I really like as opposed to sort of sitting in front of a TV screen or a movie mm -hmm. th a movie screen um, and then you have the aspect of just reading as an exercise where um, it's not just images you can get in so I'm just spitballing here that's all right 
I mean, I, of consciousness, but yeah, I always found from the I love that you can get into I think we lost you okay? You you sorry, I think my internet was That's yeah. Okay. Can you hear I, me? Yeah, all good. So anyway, so you know, I always found that from the writing standpoint, the one thing I love about comics is that you get 24 pages. You have to tell your story in those boxes. There's no you know, you write a novel, it goes as yeah. it goes wherever it goes. Nope, you got your 24 pages. You only have X number of boxes. There's only so much real estate. You got to figure out a way to tell your story. And it, it's a this like um, imposed discipline, right? You just have no options. Yeah. It's either you get your story right. told, either you get your story told in those pages or you don't. Yeah. So, all right. So quick, uh, quick interlude for those who came in a little late. If you have any questions or comments for Mike or me, send them in the chat box. And we'll get to a few at the end. All right. So, Mike, let's fast forward. Last couple of years, you've been putting your mark on the Blade Runner franchise. Um, for, first off with uh, Blade Runner 2019, which I'll bring up some images in a minute. I find that um, I've read a bunch of them now, and I find that it really does a beautiful job of capturing the spirit and style of the novel, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, and then the two movies. And we were talking about it before we came on, is that you know I did a Blade Runner panel about, um, the, about six months ago, and I read the book and watched both movies. So I really kind of soaked it all in, and I was reading your comics in between. And I really felt like, you know, it wasn't like, well, you know, it's kind of, it, it could have very easily been like Blade Runner-ish, but not really Blade Runner. To me, your your um uh your on your entries into the um into the medium and i'm going to share my screen here so that you guys can see um hold on does this tell me if you can see if this is coming up you got yeah, this here? i can see your desktop oh, oh hang on I, I didn't do this right hang i'm on. reading all your file names oh boy there we go we'll try again uh hang on bear with me i always screw this up anyway uh here we oh, go totally i do yeah there we go. Sharing. Okay, so here we go. So you, yeah, you, this is a Sid Mead cover. We've got this great thing going where we have access to the archives. So we have we put out a variant with original Sid Mead concept art every month. So so talk to me about talk to me about you know your writing. So Blade Runner, the original. I can't remember what year was it supposed to be. I can't even remember. Uh, the, the what time is it set? Do I enjoy? Dream of Electric Sheep. Oh, uh, gosh. Yeah, I don't remember the... All right. So it was, you know, what it was early yeah, yeah, yeah. whatever it was. But then the move, the second movie is 2049. This is yeah. in between. So what was it like to sort of say, well, I mean, you know, this is a really iconic um, franchise now. I mean, the, the first movie stood alone and it could have been... It was a movie that wasn't screaming out for a sequel necessarily. It just stood wow. on, on its own. And when they did the sequel, you go, Ugh, if you don't do this right, this is going to be just a, a, a heartbreaking disaster. You're going to yeah. desecrate the original. But holy cow, they really nailed it. Beautiful film, great movie. And now you've yeah. done your piece of it. How do you feel like, what was that like to sort of come in and say, whoa, you know, this is, a, this is one of the truly great sci-fi franchises in history. And now I'm going to be a part of it. Did you... Did you take any pressure to that or just say, you know what, I'm going to tell my stories and people will like them or they won't? Yeah, uh, it was goosebumps. I think in the same way that I had protection in Star Trek because I was working for Alex and Bob and closely with Bob on the comics, I had some cover. I had cover on this because Michael Green, my old friend, my old college buddy, he wrote uh, Blade Runner 2049 and um, he was the one that really had to face the fan expectation right yeah. like don't screw it up and um he just did such a beautiful job and sorry just for those who don't know just tell us just uh, 30 seconds about michael green yeah michael green um long time television and film writer uh wrote uh logan blade runner 2049 um he's worked on uh, he created a show called kings which was a beloved uh short-lived but great series he started on everwood and smallville um and you guys went to college he, together we went to college together and he's actually the one that got me into comics writing um around the same time that i was getting into star trek uh so where, where was it that you, where did you go to school 
I went to, we went to Stanford. To Stanford. So you, so you guys met at Stanford. Did you guys sort of, so how did you find each other then? Um, we were, we were sort of friends of friends at Stanford. Um, and then uh, we both ended up in LA and, and, and really got to know each other closely when we were in LA and uh, I was working in film development and he was working in TV writing. And then a friend of his invited, uh, got him in the door at DC Comics. And when he was writing for DC, he would give me his comic scripts because he was like, I don't know what I'm doing. You, I know you know comics, can you help me? And I was giving him notes and advice. And eventually he said, why don't you just write these with me? So he basically said to DC, I want to write them with this guy you don't know who's never done comics <laughs> writing. Um, but I sent them some samples of uh, writing I had done and they were like, okay. So it was pure nepotism story. I always feel bad when people ask um, why, like, how do you break into comics? And I'm like, have a friend, have a friend who's writing them. Have, um, have, the, have the right friend. I always feel guilty about that. So, uh, but Star Trek I did on my own. So, so it's okay. It evens out. And then, so Michael wrote Blade Runner 2049 and Alcon wanted to do a comic series. And uh, Titan Comics came aboard as the publisher and Michael said, hey, do you want to write Blade Runner comics with me? And I said, yeah, let's do that. And Michael's thing was very much, he didn't want to do what he calls karaoke, story karaoke, which is let's just bring back the hits. Here's Deckard in the comic book. Here's the secret history of Roy Batty. He, he really wanted to make sure we were introducing new characters and a new plot, but set in the world that people know. So um, for the folks who haven't read them, so just just give us the uh, the overview of your run on Blade Runner. Yeah, so our main character is a Blade is a Blade Runner named Ash. Um, she is uh, a woman who grew up on the streets of Los Angeles without a lot of money, um, learning to survive, and uh, her mother left her when she her mother left her to go off and work in the outdoor colonies leaving ash behind as a child to live with her grandmother uh oh this is great you've got some images here um and ash grew up hating replicants she thought she she felt like you know she she lived among the people on the street and she felt like replicants were here to replace people and they were toys of rich people um so she, she's a blade runner unlike deckard ash has a real um, when we meet her at first, she has a real aversion to almost a hatred of replicants. Um, in fact, in the first scene, we learn that after she kills a replicant, she sells their body parts on the black market. Right. So she really thinks of them as just like toasters. I love um, the fact that you've got the owl here because I what I did was I yeah, I love that. It was a little unconscious, that. and then I realized what I did in my new book. I actually have it's a it's a throwaway moment but I actually have someone is looking through a window and there's an owl perched on a tree. And that was, nice. pure, that was purely a Blade Runner reference. <laughs> yeah, and that's how we do it. You know, as opposed to having Deckard in there, we have the iconography that people know, right? So you, you have things as subtle as the owl, you have, you, then you have the obvious technology like this, the spinners and the void conf machines. That cover um, with the owl there is, uh, can you click on that? And we'll blow it up. That's by Claudia Caranfa, I believe. That's the one. Um, we've got some great, great variant covers. And then the best part of the book, if you can click on the um, dragon image there and bring that up. Russ, can you click on the... Uh... It's about as big as I can get it right now. Oh, okay. Um, can you select the other covers or just the Sid Mead one? This is what I got. Oh, okay. Um, we have this amazing interior artist, uh, Andres Guinaldo, who, you know, Blade Runner is a visual story above all, and you got to have the right artist. And in Andres, we got the guy that can draw incredible cityscapes, but then do the really kind of intimate scenes that you need for, for a noir story. Yep. So uh, we, we got a home run with the creative team, Marco Lesko on the colors, Jim Campbell on the letters. And um, yeah, it's it's been great so it's, all right, the all other right. thing i love about comics is it's yeah. very much a team a team sport oh, for sure for sure all right that was great but now it's time for a special segment where we spin the wheel on the wheel of seven possible categories wherever it lands <laughs> you get all right okay. the categories are origami dreams optic nerve the void oh comp, the void comp test electric sheep retirement party stranger in a strange land and man versus machine you ready i like the theme here all right here we go 
All right, wherever it lands, that's what you're gonna get. All right, and you've got electric sheep. All right, what is this? Oh, electric sheep. All right, so, and this one is, you're living in a Blade Runner world where the animals are gone, but you really want a pet. Assuming you could scrape the money together, what artificial animal would you buy? Well, I'm, I'm Australian by family and heritage and, and dual citizenship. So I got to go with, there are two options. One is a koala bear, which is my spirit animal. <laughs> Sleeps all day, easy maintenance, adorable. All right. The other is a bird called a cassowary, which is basically a velociraptor um, called the most dangerous bird in the world. It's got basically velociraptor claw that can eviscerate humans. Australians call it a murder chicken. <laughs> oh, do they really? A murder chicken? Yeah. Look up, look up murder chicken. And um, I, could I not? That would be good as like a, as like a guard dog, a guard chicken. So, uh, okay. All right. Well, well, those are my two, and I would keep them away from each other. Um, yeah. But I, I, they're expensive. They would be really expensive. I feel like koala would be cheaper. I feel like you could mass produce koalas. You just like McNuggets. Cassowary would be expensive. Yeah, I don't know how you order a murder chicken, but all good. All right. So yeah. thanks, Mike. So you and I are both in the writing business. So let's go to our advice column. What's yes. the best and worst writing advice someone ever gave you or, or advice you overheard? I don't know if it's bad advice so much as it's advice that doesn't work for me is right every day. I think if I think that is important for first. So I think my, my advice is take the advice that works for you. Um, I like to incubate my stories. I think the real work, at least in, in the comics I'm doing is plotting and, um, you know, getting the story right. And uh, that can that kind of work you can do. I get a lot of ideas when I'm watching stuff, when I'm watching movies and my mind will just start thinking about the project I'm working on. Um, go for, when I go for hikes and walks, like the, the simple brain exercise of coming up with a story, what is going to happen next? Um, so the actual typing, I don't feel like I need to get a certain number, a certain amount of typing done every day. Um, so I would say that's, that's my, that works for me. I don't even want to say it's advice. It's like, find out what works for you. Now you may find that you get the story work done by writing, by just going in with a blank page and not worrying about it. That's actually a good piece of advice is don't be precious. I've had, you know, I'll delete entire pages, two or three scenes, uh, two or three page scenes because, oh no, that's not going to work. Mm -hmm. So you got to kill, you don't be afraid to kill your babies. Yeah. Um, all right. I don't know. That else works for me. All right, that's good advice. All right, a new segment right. of our show is where we where we figure out if you've got thick skin. So as writers, when we put out our work yeah. and ourselves, criticism of all kinds comes with it: the good, the bad, the indifferent. How do you feel about reviews? Do you take them to heart? Do you let them roll off of you, or do some stick with you more than others? Um, I uh, I only read the good ones. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, uh, I'm used to it. I mean, I, I remember when Michael and I were writing Superman and Batman and, um, we had one person call us a black hole of fail, which I loved. I thought that was poetic. Black hole of fail. Wow. That's, um, that, that, that's a good one. That's gotta, had, go on, that's gotta go on uh, your wall of fame. Black hole of fail. So I like the ones that try. I like the ones that try. I'll tell you what, the reviews that hurt are the ones that call out something that you feel yourself. Oh, I hate that. So <laughs> if somebody's like, this scene felt rushed and you know it was rushed, yeah, like those it. are the ones that hurt, but you use that to get better, right? Yep. You use that to get better. Um, I, like, I like reviews. I don't mind a review that's negative if it shows that the person has a real knowledge and love for the, for the say, if you're working on a franchise book, you know, that's, that's fine. The ones that I don't like are like, I didn't like the drawings or um, it was boring. Just ones that don't offer anything. Yeah, but oh, overall I'm pretty, I, I like a good negative review that like is funny and gets the knives out. I don't mind that. 
<laughs> okay, fair enough. All right, so um, all right, I don't think we have any questions from the audience. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to bring back up your books. Why don't you uh, talk to us a little bit about? Um, hang on, give me one second. Here I go. All right, so we've got you've got some Blade Runner books. So um, where can folks get them, and what's next for you? What's next is uh, we're about halfway through Blade Runner 2029. Um, so how many 2019 books are there all in? There are 12 issues of 2029 divided into- I meant to three, the 2019, there are the three trades. Correct? Oh, sorry, 20, 2019. There's three trade paperbacks, four issues each for a 12 issue series. For 2029, it's also gonna be 12 issues and we have just finished the first four issues. And I think that trade paperback will be out in the next couple months. And All we're right. going to do 12 issues in 2029. All right. And, uh, and uh, after this, you got anything else on the pipeline or is this kind of what's keeping you busy? Uh, most of my day right now is spent working on Star Trek on the video game side. I'm a oh yeah, you know, we didn't talk about that at all. Uh, well, we'll have to do, we'll have, we'll have to do that a little, a yeah. little bit more next time. Uh, happy to do a, a Star Trek video game chat. Next, yep. next, oh, that's actually, I may do, oh, that's actually an interesting Star Trek video games. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm writing these things down because this is how I, no, is how I do it. video games. All right. Very cool. Okay. Well, that, that was great, Mike. Um, I want to thank you. And as for me, if you haven't already, since we've talking about Blade Runner, um, uh, I'll encourage you to check out my sci-fi noir, Crackle and Fire, featuring my hard-boiled intergalactic private eye, Angela Hardwick. I think it's part Blade Runner, part Doctor Who, part Philip Marlowe. In Crackle and Fire, Hardwick is hired to find a missing intern with stolen corporate files, but soon finds herself tackling with um, dueling gangsters, conflicting protesters, and a madman from Earth with galactic ambitions of his own. Crackle and Fire is available online and published by Crazy 8 Press. And if you'd like a signed copy, you can order one from me directly. Like All right. Well, th this, was, uh, this was a great hour. I want to thank you so much, Mike, for coming on to the show and uh, telling us about your career and your work. And I want to thank everyone who's watching. I'm your host, Russ Colchimiro. This is actually my last show of season four. I'm going to be taking a few weeks off and then I'll be back in June 9th with another round of shows to round out the summer. And that's it for me. Mike, thanks a lot. Thank and, you for uh, having me. All that right. Was this was great. And uh, I'll see you guys next time. Take care.